Hi, uh, thank you all for coming. Uh, this is the first of five status reports from the Drupal 8 initiative leads. Uh, my name is Greg Dunlap. I'm the Drupal 8 configuration management initiative lead. Uh, I work uh, at Node1 in Sweden, and uh, I also helped uh, organize the core conversations this year. Uh, I don't really, we have, we have a long um, time set aside, I think two and a half total hours to do all of these initiative updates. Um, I tried to set a lot of time because I assumed that there was going to be a lot of discussion around some of them and I wanted to give everyone time to, you know, collect up their rocks and stones to throw. Um, but it's entirely possible that this won't last the entire time and we might be done early. Uh, I don't know, we'll just have to see how it goes. So, but we've got a lot of time and so uh, if we have questions and stuff at the end of them, please feel free to get them to, to bring them up. Uh, yes, Larry? Uh, he's asking if we can do all the presentations back to back and then QA. I don't really think that's going to be necessary or efficient necessarily. Um, and I don't really have an order in mind either. Um, I was just going to see who happened to make it and then, uh, and then call them up next. But I think all of us are here right now too. So um, we'll just have to see how it goes. Um, so uh, that's me. I'm Hayrocker on Twitter uh, and on Drupal.org. So as some background, um, last year, uh, not last year, six months ago in DrupalCon Chicago, I gave a core conversation called what's wrong with our staging and deployment processes and uh, why, we're, why, we're t why, our approach, why our approach to staging and deployment is all wrong. Uh, it went really well, I was really happy with it, um, and I outlined all sorts of big grand ideas that I had about uh, ways that we could fix this going forward and uh, that, dif that differentiated a little bit in the ways that I thought that other people were doing them. Um, and after that, uh, Dries approached me and asked me if I would like to run the initiative for that, and I said to myself, oh crap. <laughs> Um, because now I've actually got to do all this stuff. It's easy to stand up here and rant and rave in front of you guys. It's actually kind of fun. Um, but um, so I said yes. And so it's a lesson to anybody who has this big idea to do a core conversation and try and get a big uh, initiative off the, uh, off the ground, I would say this. Um, so uh, after uh, Dries um, uh, asked me to do this and I said yes and I worked it out with my work to get some time to work on it and stuff, I started doing some research and looking into how other systems work and how other systems do their deployment problems. Um, and I posted some of those notes but what really came out of that is that a lot of the problems we have are unique not because uh, we're the only system with deployment problems, but because almost all of the other CMS products on the market have, have a much, much, much stricter line between content and configuration than we do. I don't think this is really, you know, brain uh, rocket science to anybody who's dealt with Drupal for a while. Um, I was a little surprised to find that everybody else had really started that way from the beginning as a concept. I thought I might find some other systems that were a little more um, in tune with us, but I really didn't. Um, so. What I started um, putting together is what I thought would be a workable battle plan for um, getting this stuff going. Um, so I, I uh, wrote that up and published it, and if you want to see it, it's at that, it's at that URL. Um, what it really outlined was um, two main, um, two main um, tacks that we were going to approach, and one was um, doing a standardized file-based configuration system that went over here and then doing, uh, getting UUIDs into core and improving the NED API over here so that we could do content staging. And we still had this problem of content and configuration, and so what I proposed was that anything that's an entity should be considered content, and anything that's not should be considered configuration. This wasn't really a um, idea that I put forth because I believed in it, because I actually believe that us separating content and configuration is sort of an impossible task at this point. And a lot of the strengths of Drupal come from the fact that they're so tightly melded together. But on the other hand, I realized that um, this is new and it's a learning experience and that actually doing it this way would teach us a lot about our content and our configuration uh, and if we ever wanted to go with a more unified system down the road, what we learned from doing this and from where our differences and similarities lie um, would, be, would be really helpful. 
Um, since then, there have been a lot of talks about moving entities into things that we would probably consider configuration, like menu items and content types and stuff like this. So I consider this an evolving discussion, basically. Um, but I don't think that necessarily for a lot of our use cases, it uh, affects a lot of what we're doing going forward. But it's worth continuing to talk and think about, and it's an important question. So um, the first uh, pass at this was starting to talk about centralized configuration. Um, a lot of this was uh, initiated and based on a core conversation that David Strauss gave in Chicago last year, where he proposed that all of our configuration should be done uh, on the file system, solely on the file system. Basically, what you did in the UI would write to files that lived on the file system, and we wouldn't have any database access at all for them. Um, and that those files should be stored in a standardized human readable format like JSON. Um, we had a code sprint in Denver. That's uh, Larry Garfield, me, Chex, Angie, and David uh, at the Aiton Design Lab offices in Denver. Um, and we sat there and hacked away at things for about four days. Um, we came up with this idea of doing things in files, but also storing them in the database at the same time. So you have kind of a two storage system. Um, the files would be canonical and the database storage would be um, the stuff that you access most often. Um, it allows us to sort of do um, one of the things that we were concerned about was the security, because if we're doing JSON files, they're readable by anybody who can browse the inter who can browse to the directory and knows the name of the files. And so um, and, and, but that file directory also has to be world writable so that the Apache can write to it. And so we were really concerned about the security of that and um, we came up with some ideas around that and um, this two-stage system was also part of that because we were going to key the files and if you could, and if you saw that the key was busted, that the key was wrong and your data had changed out from underneath you, you still had this database storage that you could fall back on. It meant your site didn't die if your files were messed up, which we thought was important. It had some other benefits too, but... Um, so uh, at the end of that, um, at the end of, and this would also be designed to replace what is our variable system now, and probably parts, uh, or at least some use cases for the system table and some other things. Um, and after that was over, I posted a, or Angie posted, actually we wrote it together, a, a big outline of our proposal for um, what we were gonna do with this. And we linked to the, uh, to the sandbox where he had written our prototype code. And uh, then uh, we opened it up for comments and wow, did you guys deliver. Um, so um, a lot of good things came out of that discussion. Um, we improved the security model, I think. Um, we changed some of the ways that we were going to store the files because originally to secure them we had kind of, we, we were kind of going to make this bastardized json.php format so that they would still be json but they'd be executable so you couldn't read them and blah blah blah. Uh, that was an extremely unpopular proposal. So we came up with some other alternatives uh, around that and worked with the security team to figure that out. Um, and we also started a very, very, very long discussion about the file formats and what the file formats should be. Um, and should they be JSON and should they be any file, should they be XML, blah, blah, blah. Went back and forth and back and forth for a long time. And uh, finally, I posted a thing about two weeks ago where I said, I'm going to say we should just use XML. And you guys give me a good reason not to. But if I don't get a good reason not to, this is what we're going to do. And I haven't gotten any good reasons not to. So I'm going to say right now, this is what we're going to do. Um, it's, I, think it's, I, think it's, I think it's really important that we uh, do that and that we take the API and that we don't bake the a don't bake XML into the API. We should make the XML as agnostic to the file format as possible because we may end up digging ourselves into a hole with the file format or making it pluggable later and stuff like that. Um, but I think it's really important to make these decisions and move on. And one of the things that I haven't really done, I think, as well as I could in this initiative is time boxing things and saying, we're going to talk about this for a week and then we're going to move on. And a lot of this stuff has dragged on for a while and I was on vacation in the States for, uh, for you know, I've been, I've been, I think out of the last three months I've been traveling two and a half of them. So, you know, that hasn't helped anything and stuff either. Um, so, um, another thing that came out of a lot of those discussions is that we kind of decided that, um, you know, storing, storing the files and making the files canonical is, is um, we could avoid that whole problem if we didn't store the files all the time at all. Because, you know, 
uh, a lot of what our discussions were about was the security issues of having these files sitting on disk. And we were going around and around and around and around about this. And then somebody, I don't remember who, it might have been Czech, suggested that if we don't store the files all the time at all, I mean, we're using the, second, the database store almost all the time when we access stuff. The only reason we need the files is for if you happen to need to edit one by hand to do overrides or something like that or if you're pushing your deployment. So why don't we turn it into the database store is the main thing and, and, it becomes an, and your deployments become an export and import operation essentially. Um, there was a lot of pop, I, I wasn't a big fan of that but it was very popular and so I think, we're go I, I, uh, I think we decided that we're going to do that. It hasn't been written um, but that was another change that came out of the discussions from the community um, after our original proposal. Did I miss anything there, Larry? Yeah, a summary of, of three long months of our lives. Um, so that's sort of where the file-based uh, configuration stuff stands right now. Um, I think we need to get back to the, I think it's really important that we get back to coding and prototyping after all this talking and discussing. Uh, I don't want to get into any more analysis paralysis on this at this point. Um, and maybe we'll start talking about next steps about that at the Code Sprint on Friday. So that was the first sort of three prongs of my initiative. The second prong was actually, um, originally there was a, uh, the second prong was that I wanted to get UUIDs worked into core and I wanted to implement them throughout our entity system. And um, Peter Wolanin came up to me and said, um, it's really dumb for you to do this because we're going to be reworking the entity system uh, anyways and then it's going to be a waste of time you're just going to end up throwing all that code away. And I'm like, well, who's redoing the entity system? Somebody, is somebody actually doing it? I've heard a lot of talk. And he's like, well, I want to do it. And I'm like, well, why don't you come in here and, and do it with me and then we can turn it into uh, part of the initiative because I need it and it's, you know, it's, it's something I want to see happen anyways. And he said, okay, so uh, reworking the uh, entity API uh, got moved under the auspices of my initiative, as it were. Uh, I don't really know what that means other than uh, me saying I need this and giving them access to my sandbox to work. But um, Peter and Fago and Catch have been working on that mostly. Uh, their main first task is to move the stuff in any.inc into a proper module and then to uh, build a CRUD API. Hello, Cleveland. Um, so, um, and then uh, building a proper CRUD API on top of it, which we don't really have. I think that's really important. It enables a lot of, a lot of uh, it, it, it uh, opens the way for us to do a lot of stuff with entities even outside of my initiative. Um, and it will, it, will give us, it will give us a pathway towards proper content import export for maybe the first time in our entire lives. Um, if anybody saw Damien's core conversation about uh, document-oriented storage yesterday, uh, it, would, it would start opening up a pathway for us to build that underneath entities. Um, so outside of my initiative or anything, it's, uh, this is a good thing. And so um, Peter and Fago are having a core conversation tomorrow at 11 about this, if anybody wants to come. Um, this first link here is a pointer to the issue that they have in the queue uh, about moving entities uh, out into a module. What's the status of that issue right now? Needs review. So get on it, people. Um, and then that second link is uh, a link to notes from a boff that they ran about entities and the path forward for entities at DrupalCon Chicago, if anybody's really interested in the ideas that other people have about what, where the entities should go forward. Um, so the last part of this is the content staging thing. Um, in some ways, this is the um, easiest part of it because nobody cares about this but me. <laughs> um, and so I can just do all this work and nobody hassles me about it, which is great. Um, but um, the basic plan for this is that um, whenever there are two really big problems that we have with content staging right now. One is that uh, because we're using uh, because we're using the serialized IDs and uh, the auto ink IDs in uh, the databases, we have no control over what they are, and they shift from server to server, and so it's impossible to uniquely identify content. 
The second problem is that the way that Drupal's APIs are now, especially the way that they're so tied into form API, it's extremely difficult to save to save nodes or any other content in a in a reasonable way. And entities were a step forward with that, but because the API never really got finished, it's still not really there for Drupal 7. And so um, my idea for content for content staging was if we get UUIDs and a proper entity API, then even if we don't build any content staging into Drupal itself, we've we've got a big win. And if that falls out to contrib for Drupal 8 and we never do anything more with that, I think I'm pretty happy, actually. So um, the first patch for uh, UUIDs and core is in, is in the queue right now. Uh, it was written by Dick Olson, who's working right now in Qatar for Al Jazeera. Um, and it's really just an API patch. It just introduces a bunch of functions that we'll need to do UUIDs and core. Uh, the next steps in that will be that once the entity API stuff is finished, then we start working the generation and saving and retrieval of those UUIDs into the API. And then, um, and then we decide what we're going to do with it, um, which is a whole other question, needs to talk about use cases and user stories, and do we, how much of this do we want to bake into Drupal as a release, and how much do we want to leave to contrib and stuff like that, which is a discussion we haven't even started. Um, but. Uh, my outline for getting all of this done and my steps and plan for it is at that node right there. Um, and so that's really where that aspect of the uh, initiative is at at this point. So uh, what are some problems that we've had as we've been moving forward? Uh, discussions are hard. And so one of, one of the problems with the discussions that we've been having, and we've talked about it a lot among the initiative owners, is that um, our tools for having discussions on Drupal.org uh, infrastructure are really, really poor. We have uh, issue queues, which some people say is where all the discussions should happen, but anybody who's followed a long meta issue in the issue queues knows how horrifying that is. It's really good for jumping to the end and seeing what the most recent comments are and stuff, but it's really hard to follow the context of a conversation through it. On the other hand, we have GDO, which is good in some ways also, but uh, some people hate threaded comments, and it's really hard to to, in both of these cases, to kind of tie a bunch of topics together. For instance, when we made our first blog post about the overarching uh, proposal we had, I got 400 comments, and I'm like, oh, this is too much. And so I started breaking out into subtopics and sub-discussions, but then what would happen is people would jump into those sub-discussions without any of the overarching context that we provided in the first post. And they're making these comments where they don't understand what we're getting into and what our priorities are and stuff like this. Uh, and I don't have a really good answer for how to manage that at this point. Um, I think it'll be easier when we get to coding because that's the way that we're all used to working and we're all used to working in the issue queues and um, you know in the past even when we've done big architectural changes I don't think we've really tried to open them up to community input so much as I'm trying to do here because I think it's really important you know a lot of people um, complained that when the field API was designed that it was kind of five guys in a smoke-filled room and they came out with this proposal and anyone who didn't give a proposal, anyone who didn't agree was kind of like, well, that's too bad, that's what we decided. It didn't really happen that way, but that was the impression that people had. And so I was really uh, focused and I made clear to Dries that I didn't want anybody to come out of this process feeling that way. Of course, now I'm feeling the, the pain and kind of, and you know, kind of like, uh, why don't we all just go off in a smoke-filled room and figure this out? So, um, I, th I still think it's really important, but I need to figure out a way to have these discussions, to have the context, and to get everything together and keep them focused in all of this. And it's really, and it's, and I'm still trying to figure that out. And it's hard for me because I live across the sea from where almost everybody who's commenting on these issues live. And and it's nice that I have people like Larry and David to keep a track on of them on North American time and stuff like that. But still, uh, that's something I'm still trying to sort out. I think one thing that's really important that I haven't been doing is I, I haven't been time boxing the discussions very well. So they just sort of go on and on and on and on. And you know, I think I think it's really important to open them up to more of like a uh, we're going to discuss this for a week and then we're going to make a decision and then we're going to move forward. And that leads to sort of that I need to be quicker on the trigger about decisions and you know and and push things forward. This is a really new kind of role for me. Um, and 
uh, you know, even when I've done core development in the past, it's been really kind of uh, high impact, easy win stuff, a lot of documentation API changes and easy bugs and stuff like that. So my experience with the core development and the teams isn't the same as a lot of other people's and I don't have a lot of this, uh, you know, cat herding experience. And so I'm trying to grow into this too. And I think, uh, I, think, I think things will be better going forward. And I credit WebChick a lot for helping me out and I've been really appreciative of that. So next steps. Uh, we need to code. We need to start coding. I think that's really important. I think that's what people in the core um, development team want to see. They want to see actual stuff happening. And so I think it's really important that we start doing that. So my first step will be to start updating our sandbox code from the code sprint with the results of the discussions that we had uh, on GDO. And then um, once we've done that, we can start, once that API is finished and everybody's happy with it, we can start actually going in and starting to replace some of the stuff from variables tables, trying to see if we can implement field configuration with this system, trying to rewrite system settings form to use it and things like that. And I think that'll really teach us a lot is when we start getting into those implementations. We need to keep for moving forward on the UUID and entity work and uh, that's still happening and, um, that's, and that's all good. And we just need to keep talking and pushing forward. We need to talk and push forward both. We can't just talk and we can't just go. There's a right balance we really need to find. And I don't think we found it yet, but I think it's important to keep figure, trying to figure that out. Uh, this is not the same slide. And that's all I've got to say. And now I will open the floor to questions from the audience. Yes, Jennifer. The question is, are you planning on having the revisions as well as the base entities have UUIDs? Um, I've seen some of the discussions around that, and I haven't really thought it through myself, but my initial, uh, my initial uh, response is I think that's probably a good idea, though. Um, so, um, but, I mean, obviously... We'll turn it on, why not? So I'm thinking about the help system that we're thinking about for Drupal 8, hopefully, um, where we would be probably importing um, help documents from a centralized help server or maybe multiple centralized help server. And you could conceivably revise it on your own site and then want to know whether you should pull in the next revision from the other site. And you kind of want to have a UUID on the revision so you can tell where you are in the revision cycle or something like that. Um, all right. Um, I, th you know, I, you know, the more I think about it, the harder I find it to believe that we wouldn't put UUIDs on revisions. But I mean, um, it's something we have to talk through too. Yes. Uh, the question was, wouldn't it be better to store the UUIDs in the database as binary instead of text? Um, I would have to think about the pros and cons of that. Uh, I suspect Larry has an opinion about that. Which we're not, by the way. I didn't mention that here, but we're not, we're not planning on, we're planning on keeping the auto increment primary keys. The UUIDs will just lay next to them because the process of converting to UUID primary keys has an immense performance impact and as, as an upgrade path thing, oh my God, it makes me want to shoot myself. So, I mean, um, that's, that's our plan. So anyways. Can yes, please. Yeah. If you're concerned about your database size at that point, you've got bigger problems. <laughs> one, one blog post is larger than all of your UIDs combined. At least blog posts I write. <laughs> um, anybody else? Really? Man, I expected lots of rocks. All right, well, thanks. Um, which of the initiative owners, Larry? Okay. Okay, uh, I think we can get started. Um, so this is uh, update number two. This is for the Web Services and Context Core Initiative, one of the uh, more verbosely named uh, initiatives we have. 
Uh, I'm Larry Garfield, or Krill, uh, Senior Architect with Palantir.net. Um, various other things I'm not listing here. Uh, and yeah, really mean with a Nerf gun. And Ken Rickard over here can verify that. <laughs> um, <Jeez. laughs> so we're talking about the Web Services and Context Core Initiative, or WSCI. Uh, it's so named because I like funny acronyms. I, that's how you know I'm an open source geek. Um, so a bit of background. Back in 2009, during an online um, chat with Lisa Reichelt, Earl Miles made the comment that Drupal doesn't have multiple layouts. It has one layout that it bends a lot. And it's really unfortunate that he said that because it got me thinking, and that's never a good thing. Uh, thinking, OK, just what could we do to give Drupal multiple layouts and nothing else? You know, make life easier for designers. And I thought this through and then came up with a presentation at the uh, Developer Summit at DrupalCon San Francisco, which is like the precursor of the core conversations, in which I basically laid out, this is what our page layout system looks like now. You have main content area, and then these block regions on the side, and these blocks that know nothing about anything. And if you want to do anything that doesn't look like this, you're kind of screwed. And you know, your options are hack the template to, to pieces or use panels. And what we really want to do on the front end is something that looks more like this, where you have requests come in, we build up some more intelligent metadata based on that. That's we, we call context. It's in the more robust definition of the request. Pass that to a display controller, which then uh, gets rendered into this one big region, inside of which are regions, inside of which are regions, inside of which are blocks. And you just keep passing this information down. The idea here is each of these uh, blocks can be rendered independently of each other. You can lay them out independently of each other. You can have complex layouts like this. Um, you can change the context information at this point, uh, going from one layer to the next. Um, and basically, if any of you are looking at this and saying, wow, this looks familiar, that's because this is pretty much the conceptual logic behind panels. Um, you know, arrived at it by a different path, but it's essentially the same concept. Uh, and we, we identified um, five basic things in Drupal that make it impossible to do this in core right now. <clears throat> uh, the fact that we have no unified context system. We have you know, a half dozen, correction, several dozen uh, different functions that work differently in some globals that you can't really override without breaking things. Um, we only have the ability to support one layout. There's no way to define multiple layouts. We have no good system for defining swappable components. We have a one-off thing for blocks. That sucks. We have a one-off thing for page callbacks, which sucks. We have a one-off thing for input formats or text filters, which sucks. Continue on down the line. Um, the entire system assumes you're returning an HTML page. And even just returning an HTML fragment requires um, essentially hacking around the menu system. Uh, and of course, your performance is a problem because of how much work we're doing as a result of all of this. So this gave birth in San Francisco to the Butler project, <clears throat> which was basically in order to solve this layout problem, we have to solve all of these other problems first. Uh, overall idea is to give Drupal a unified, powerful context system that supports uh, smarter block-centric layouts using a common plugin mechanism. It's a mouthful. And a lot of discussions happened on this uh, summer of last year um, that kind of focused into a uh, presentation I gave at DrupalCon Copenhagen, which unfortunately was not recorded because of a technical glitch. Um, but that's basically you know, refining this idea. And then it was refined a bit more. Um, and so some code was written by DrupalCon Chicago where I gave a, essentially an earlier version of this talk at the core conversation track there. And then Dries came up and said, hey, Larry, this sounds like it'd be useful for web services. You want to lead a, a core initiative? And much like Greg, I'm like, yes, crap. Um, yeah, congratulations. That's, that's how everything in core works. Um, <clears throat> so the basic idea of the web service initiative is more or less the same thing. Um, which is we want to transform Drupal from being a CMS into a REST server. 
that happens to have a damn good CMS on top of it. <clears throat> and to do that, we have to do all of the stuff Butler was talking about. So it, part of the challenge with Drupal right now is that making our layout system not suck requires no, uh, re -ramp, uh, rewriting our routing mechanism to be a REST router because those overlap so much in core that we can't do one without the other. So let's just solve both problems. Uh, in particular, you know, break it up into four pieces because that's a big mouthful. We want a unified, powerful context system uh, so that all incoming information we access through a single channel. We get rid of our globals, we get rid of dollar underscore get, dollar post. Um, all of this information we handle in a consistent fashion. And we can then use that to build a really powerful in-core plugin system. Make more things swappable in the same way, rather than making them swappable in a different way for every single system we run across. With those two tools, we can then build a much better router in core, essentially a replacement for hook menu, that can deal with the fact that not everything is an HTTP GET request for a full HTML page for a desktop browser. Within three years, that will be the minority of traffic on the web. So let that sink in. Within three years, requesting a full HTML page for a desktop browser will be a minority of the web. And then you know, build these smart block-centric panels-like uh, layouts <coughs> that give us real, a great deal more flexibility on the design level. Uh, more flexibility in terms of caching pages for better for, uh, performance because we can partially cache based on the blocks. Um, you know, replace the entire stack there because we can't change one part of it without changing the others. So since Chicago, there's been a ton of discussion and basically everything Greg just said about the challenges of doing architecture in the open like that uh, apply here too. So what he said, um, there have been a lot of very long threads that uh, suck your soul, but need to happen anyway. Um, <clears throat> but we do have a viable plan moving forward at this point that we are starting to work on. Step zero, geeks like to start at zero, is an actual way of handling HTTP. Right now, our way of handling an incoming HTTP request is global dollar get, which we overwrite portions of before Drupal even finishes booting up, which is already doing something bad. We kind of wrap dollar post in the form system, but only in the form system. If you're doing non-form stuff with post, then you kind of are on your own. And any information that you derive off of that, uh, even like what type of request this is, do you, does the browser want JavaScript back? Does it want HTML back? We have no common way of tracking that. So rather than write our own complete wrapper layer for incoming HTTP requests, there are lots of them out there. So we first uh, spent some time looking at the Peckle module uh, for HTTP handling and basically came to the conclusion we can't require that to be installed on the server. Porting it to user space would be way too much work and probably wouldn't work anyway, so let's not do that. So then we started saying, okay, we need to find a good third-party library here. And uh, Dave Hall and Dick Olson, are either of you here? Okay. They, they did some excellent... What's that? Okay, well, I know Dick's around here somewhere, um, but they did some really great research for us um, looking at the HTTP libraries inside the Zen framework and inside Symfony 2, which are two of the largest component frameworks, very modern, freshly rewritten. Um, so they've done an awful lot of work that then we don't have to do and say, okay, can we piggyback off of them in a good open source fashion? And their research is posted here. Uh, these slides will be online, so you don't need to write that down. And um, contrary to all of the threads that came before it, the conclusion that pretty much everyone in the thread drew was Symfony. So we want to use the Symfony 2 HTTP library for handling incoming requests, and that's our level zero. Uh, so hopefully this is the start of, you know, our, our projects working together more. Um, I let you decide which is the mouse, which is the cat. <laughs> Mostly, I just wanted an excuse to use this slide. <laughs> um, and as of last night at 2 a.m., Dries told me that he's okay with doing this, so I'm gonna be writing the patch for this very soon to just drop in portions of Symphony 2 into Drupal Core for Drupal 8.
Now, my hope is that Dries was awake enough at 2 a.m. to remember that he said this. <laughs> yes, Jen. <laughs> Uh, the yeah. So yeah, it, the question is, is this the first time we've done this? No. Um, there have been other examples, um, but it's not something we do often. Uh, so it, it is a major event. But the fact that we got it approved yesterday is, means we can move forward with that. Um, then step one is a unified context system. Uh, this is where most of the work has been done. We actually developed an API for the most part back in Copenhagen. <coughs> so that's now a year ago. Um, it's based on, the, on a mediator object, a, a butler object, essentially. The idea being that um, when you want information about the request, which includes information that derives from the request, like what's the current node being requested, you don't check that directly. You instead ask this uh, common broker, okay, what is the current node? And it will tell you. Or it can lie to you if you want to, you know, do fancy caching, you can encapsulate uh, your plugin, your block, your whatever very well. That makes it unit testable, that makes it easy to uh, cache it independently of the rest of the page, that means you can do an AHA request, you can do ESI caching, all kinds of fun stuff. Basic idea, you know, some piece of code asks this butler object, this context object, you know, what is the value of this HTTP property? What is uh, the currently active node? What is the current user? So global user goes away and gets replaced with you know, some handler that just returns that context information that you can use. <coughs> um, work in progress on this is in a, a project. Currently, this is a Drupal 7 project, but it's not like there's a difference bet between that and Drupal 8 at the moment. And hopefully by the end of the week, I'll have this in a, a sandbox, uh, a core sandbox. Uh, basic API, if you have a class, then you get a context object passed into you, and you just save that. When you want to say, what's, my current, you know, what's the current node, you access it that way. What's you know, the value of this get variable? You use this colon delimited format, which means you can assign a single handler right here, and then um, you know, one context handler that handles all of those requests. And this is the only way that you access this information. You do not ever touch $get directly. You do not ever touch global user, it goes away. You do not ever touch uh, global language, that goes away. Everything is accessed through this context object. And if you're in procedural code, then you have this Drupal get context function uh, that gets you the topmost object, context object. Um, you can register a you know, new handler this way. So when you get this request, this is the class that handles it. Here's some configuration information. I'm just going to blitz past this. Um, one important factor, it is overridable. So you can say, OK, you know, this, I've got this object. Add a new layer. Now I've got a new context object. I'm going to set some additional configuration on that, lock it, and then pass that along. So now this code here, or whatever is happening inside there, does not know anything about this object. All it knows is your overridden form here. This is a very good thing because it allows you to segment parts of the system. It allows you to, to pull pieces apart by going through this mediator in between. We can unit test things. Uh, we can, um, you know, like as I was saying before, we can ESI cache this way because you can fake this out very, very easily. Uh, Current status on that. There is one patch left that I want to get committed before we can start implementing it in core to see what happens. Um, I'm going to try and get that committed tonight. I need to re review it. Actually, I have two possible implementations of that. Um, my, my plan is if I can get that in and get a uh, sandbox going by Friday, then come on Friday, we can just start implementing this in core, see how far we can get replacing global user, see how far we can get replacing global language. Um, and you know, figure out if there's problems there, where the, the gaps still are, and hopefully get something going that we can have Dries push back into core and get, really get rolling in Drupal 8. At least that's the plan. So who's going to come on Friday and help with that? Awesome. I'll see you there. Um, phase two, plugins. Um, yeah, we've got way too many of them. Let's unify this crap. Basic logic we're looking at here, you, know, you have a plugin type. You have various plugins that conform to that type. 
And then when you want to use it, you have some configuration and some context, the, the current context object. Combine those, you get a plugin object, and you can then just use that. And this works for all kinds of things. This, uh, like the canonical example would be the cache system. So you've got cache interface, an actual PHP interface language construct, different possible implementations of it, you have configuration, and then you just go use that object. Cache, um, in performats, sessions, um, you know, all kinds of things. Uh, entity backends, all right, entity storage backends. Um, I've been talking to uh, Yves Chedemois, he really wants to use the system to clean up the API for uh, formatters and widgets and fields in Drupal. So all of these things, hopefully we can get working on the same, uh, inter the same uh, architecture. Uh, we all did some research here as well. Um, we looked at Symfony 2's plugin framework, Zen frameworks, and Kohana's. And the basic conclusion was none of them were doing anything even close to the level of complexity we needed. In fact, the closest system conceptually is our own CTools module. So thank you, CTools team. Um, <clears throat> so the current plan there is essentially a cleaned up, purely object-oriented version of CTools plugins that we slide into core. Um, there's actually two different uh, implementations right now that we put together just kind of as experimental work. One I wrote a while back, one Nick Limdell has been working on. And honestly, they're about 80% the same thing, give or take some terminology. They're, they're very, very close. Um, I don't have the sandbox URLs off, uh, available off the top of my head, unfortunately. Um, but we're sitting on that for the moment and we can come back to it after we get the context in course. We can really get rolling with that. Uh, but I'm hoping that we can just build off of one of those two approaches um, and just roll with that. And once we have that built, then we can start the fun stuff, which is using these plugins and this context information to do real web server routing, to actually use HTTP properly, unlike most PHP frameworks. Um, current plan, uh, based on a conversation we had here, is um, a two-layer approach. So currently, request comes in, all we match it against is the path, and that's it, and we pass it off to a function. Instead, we match it against as much information out of the HTTP request itself as we can, uh, which is the method, I forgot a comma, comma there, the path, the domain, and the content type. Um, that is like, this is a get request, or a post request, or a delete request to this domain, or to any domain, this path, and the browser is requesting type slash j, uh, text slash JSON, or text HTML, or application PDF. And we can then return a true HTTP 200 request, or a true 404, rather than hacking our way around it, or a true, um, you know, moved. There's a ton of information in HTTP, in that spec, that we're not using, that if we really want to be serious about web services, we really want to be serious about mobile, we have to use. And this lets us handle all of that stuff in a clean fashion rather than just hacking around a page system. <clears throat> uh, again, lots more detail here. Uh, I encourage you to look at that. Uh, oh yeah, and other stuff like node type is a secondary layer that we haven't figured out the details on yet. Yes, Peter? because you, we want um, that router to be uh, swappable. We also want, you know, what this is gonna map to is a uh, configured plugin object that is that display controller. And this is, again, very similar to the way panels works conceptually, um, where you know, what you get back from here is not name of function, it's an ob name of an object or class and configuration. And that's plugin based, so it's uses that same consistent API as everything else. Architecture-wise, we're already starting to work on this. You know, if you uh, want to help with this, this is uh, probably the best place to join in the discussion right now. Um, but a lot of it is, we're going to need some of this functionality anyway, so might as well, again, use a single system for it. Does that answer your question? Well, but it sounds like you're just saying we could implement this before the plugin is up. Portions of it we might be able to. Um, Yes, some parts possibly. We definitely we need the context part for it since that's where we'd, where we'd be getting this information. Um, 
you know, I, at the moment, I'm not sure yet how much of this system is going to technically be a plugin. Uh, that's a good conversation we still need to have, so let's start a thread on that one. Um, actually, yeah, check, check this group. We actually do have some discussion there at the moment, but that's an open question, frankly. Uh, so it, parts of this may not need plugins, you're right. And finally, uh, get onto the smart block layout, which is essentially panels in core. So number three is services in core, step four is panels in core, at the you know, 50,000 foot level anyway. Um, so far, we've not done a great deal here yet because there's a lot of work left to do other than try and figure out, okay, the biggest problem with panels is that the UI is way too complicated for mere mortals to use. People in here can figure it out, but most people can't wrap their head around it. So we're trying to figure out, so for the record, Sam Boyer can figure it out, but I did say mere mortals. <laughs> um, so yeah, we're, we're trying to figure out what a better UI would be for a layout mechanism that is all panels based that people can actually understand. And so uh, Boyan and Yoroi have been helping out there to figure out, okay, let's think this thing through. There's still a lot of work to be done here, so if you're interested in UX, if you're interested in figuring out how to make a UI for all of this stuff that doesn't suck, uh, talk to me, talk to Boyan, talk to Yoroi. Is Yoroi here? Yoroi is not here, so talk to either Boyan or I. Um, I joined this group, there's a lot of discussion there. Um, and, you know, this is still a ways away in terms of implementation, but we're going to need that long to figure out the UI um, because we have to get that right. So next steps at this point, Friday, code sprint. Let's try and get some uh, forward motion on context so you can you know, jumpstart uh, the actual code writing. Um, if you want to follow the discussions we're having, it's uh, groups.drupal.org slash whiskey, W-S-C-C-I. Um, if you just want to keep tabs on what's going on, there is a uh, tracking issue uh, on Drupal.org. There's the NID for it. Um, we're not discussing anything there. It's just status updates. If you want to get pinged when something major happens, I'll be posting comments there. Otherwise, almost everything in that thread is, a, is someone saying subscribe. Uh, so feel free to add more. I, I'm encouraging people to say plus one subscribe on that issue and that issue alone. Um, and that's it. Questions? No one has any questions? There's a question. Um, if the router maps things to a response object instead of a function, that means any module that wants to implement a path is going to have to have some kind of error code in it. Does that really increase complexity? Uh, the question is if the router is always mapping to a uh, response object, does that mean that every module has to have OO code and is therefore more complex? Two answers to that. One, First half, I'm not sure yet if that means that every page callback turns into a new class. Um, it may be that there's still a function uh, and there's a common you know, class for the configuration is subcall to this other function for the body. We don't know yet. That's still a very open question. Uh, to the second question, you know, it, it does, you know, that means it has a class in it and therefore it's more complex. Something having a class in it does not make it inherently more complex. Half the time it makes it 10 times simpler. Other questions? Use, use what? Command line. Hmm? I mean, uh, command line implementation. Oh, a command line. Um, so the question is, uh, does you, you're basing this on HTTP make it harder to do command line stuff like Drush? Actually, no. Because if all Drupal code is accessing that HTTP information through this context object, then it becomes trivial for Drush to have its own context object that mocks all of that information that's relevant or has its own information. So everything we're doing here is viable for Drush and hopefully Drush can actually simplify a great deal by building off of that same very low level. Um, it's kind of, in, in an ideal ponycorn world, um, Drush and um, Drupal and the Drupal installer and the Drupal updater are, th are all f different applications built on top of this core framework. I don't know if we'll actually get to that point, but that's kind of the mystic goal that we're trying to push towards conceptually. Other questions? All right, then I'll see you all on Friday and stick around for, who's next, Gaber? Yeah. Stick around for uh, Gaber who's gonna be talking about um, internationalization and what we're doing in Drupal 8 for that. 
So um, this is my update from the Drupal 8 multilingual initiative. I'm uh, Gabor Hoichi, and I was uh, relatively recently named an initiative lead for this uh, project after uh, Larry and Greg. And um, the way I wanted to start this is to look at what what's really the goal of what we want to support in Drupal. And the, the most basic, basic thing where a language comes into play in Drupal is if you want to build a foreign language site. So as long as you want to do an English language site as it is intended by the Drupal developers with the original English text, uh, you don't need to care about language. If you want to do a foreign language site, which can be an English language site with different text in English, but with like different wording, uh, then this is the foreign language site that you want to build. And what we need to have there is we need to know the language you are building the site in. So we have language information on what you're actually working with. And because the built-in uh, code in Drupal is, uh, is all in English, we also need to support translating that uh, built-in code, built-in UI to a different language. If that different language is just like different wording in English, it's from our perspective is still a different language. Um, so that's, that's about it for a foreign language site, okay? So if you want to build like a German site and you, and it's purely German, there's nothing else in there, uh, everything's in German, then we need to know it's in German and we need to let you translate everything in the code that was in English to German. And all the rest of the site, the views, the menus, the blocks, everything you built in, so you can put in German. There's no need to, um, to, um, to do anything with that. It's a single foreign language site. But when multiple languages come into play, there's other things to consider. So we need to expand the set of languages we support. So now we have multiple languages, which means we need to be able to select from them. Uh, we need to be able to, uh, to know in this uh, request which language we use or in this part of the request which language we use. And that ties in a lot with the uh, context um, initiative we have there. And also, um, that's kind of an interesting word. Anyway, so we, we, need, to, we need to know uh, which language we have and we need to be able to select from that language. And in Drupal 7, we have multiple types of languages. I'm not sure you're aware, but we have content language, we have uh, user interface language, and we have URL language. And these can be three different languages in Drupal 7. Not many people know that, but that is how it is. Um, and that's a multilingual site. So if you have a multilingual site that is a blog, and you post in German, and you post in English, and you never translate to another language, then you don't need to have translation support. You just need to have, you just need to label your stuff with different languages, okay? So we need to know which part of your site is in which language, but we don't care about uh, translating all those. If you need translation, so you need to actually relate different things together, then translation comes into play. So in that case, we need to relate different uh, data objects together based on uh, their relation through the language. So this is a relation problem. We have different um, data elements and we need to relate them based on they are the translation of the same thing. So that is the concept there. So those are the main things that we need to care about. We need to know the language of everything uh, we need to be, let you translate the UI. We need to be able to select from available data based on your criteria. And we need to be able to support translation on a fully, a fully multilingual site with translation. So we don't have a lot of that in core, unfortunately. What we have is we have uh, languages, we have UI translation, we have node language support in Drupal 6 with node translation. We have support for path, we have support for path aliases. Uh, kind of interestingly, and we have a very, um, a very broken system for configuration translation, and we'll talk a little bit about that later. In Drupal 7, this was uh, added on with field translation, uh, with date format language support, and with comment language support. Now, you might notice when you actually build Drupal websites, these are just like the very, very basic pieces that you work for, right? So. 
there's a lot of things you build on websites that don't have any language support. So we have blocks, we have menus, you have all kinds of configuration like views, your site name, your rules, your panels, your everything. And I just hold above before this session on, um, on multilingual problem sharing and, pro and use case uh, discussions. And we've had like an interesting question, how you translate a panel? And the answer was you kind of use a view because that supports translation better and you uh, use views to provide the data for the panel panes and, you know. So, so one of the problems is we don't have any language information of that. And the second problem is you don't have any translation support for that in core. So internationalization model tries to plug in these holes by trying to provide some language information and trying to provide some translation support. But the, the most important problem is that, that for a lot of things we don't know the language. So when you start off with a site, you put in the site name, you create three views, and we don't know the language those were created in. If you change the site language, it's going to break. And we don't have any language-based selection and display is one of the most um, requested things. It's like, I've, I've installed this site, I've, I've, I did content translation, and my homepage is showing every language. We're like, yes, that is how it works. There's no selection there. So let's see content as, a, as the most important part. I, I made a, like a 20-minute video of this. I'm trying to do a very short su summary of that here. Uh, so I apologize for anybody who's who've seen this, but I think um, anybody uh, remember seeing this video that I put up with these images? Not a lot of people. Okay, so um, so just so you know, the the what what what's what what's our way for content translation is the most important part in my initiative. Um, so we have Drupal 6 with locale support, which means that when you have a node with all their properties, what we do is that we tack on language information in the node. So we know it's in German, it's in English, it's in French. And we have content translation, which means that we have that node with language information and we relate other nodes in other languages to that node. And for this relation set, we call it a translation set. And we say this, these three nodes are translations of the same thing. And we uh, kind of have a source uh, node there that is the source uh, data. And there is those translations of that node. So we have a translation set of nodes. Okay, that was in Drupal 6 with content translation. That's a very good model for a lot of reasons. So for example, you, want, you have this node and you have copies for this node for translation. So you have different copies of the nodes. For, um, for these nodes, all of those nodes can have different authors. So all of those nodes can have different permissions in a workflow setting. If you run with, uh, with Workbench module, you can put in those nodes into different uh, queues for different people. And, and you, can, uh, you can work with like these single, single objects. And the permissions are handled separately. The um, attributions handled separately. They have different status fields, so you can have different workflow. In the European Union, there's a requirement to post, um, to, when you like posting official documents, they need to be available in certain set of languages. And, and until the, all those are available, they shouldn't be posted. So you set up a workflow, you're waiting for all those languages to be available before they are posted. They can have different uh, status than the rest of the languages which are still waiting to be translated and are not required for the initial post. Um, these have separate menu items, so if you want to have language-dependent menus, like different menu trees for different languages, then you can do this, okay? So it's a very good model for these reasons. The problem is that you have these different copies of the nodes, and there's a lot of things that relate to nodes, like signups, like organic group memberships, like votes, five star, whatever. So a lot of things relate to nodes and they say, I vote for this node or I'm a member of this node or I sign up for this node or I buy this node. And if we have a translation set, the module that implements group membership or sign up or votes, they need to be aware of you either becoming a member of a node or a translation set. And that's not actually happening. Um, in fact, there's also fields which, um, which uh, carry a lot of data or, or can be painful to be duplicated in these different copies. So the problem is that you have your source node and different copies of the node. And if you have an image field like a product node, 
like on a product node, then those need to be duplicated. Or if you have a product price, those need to be duplicated. So this is kind of a problem. So Drupal 7 introduced field translation, which solved this issue by putting translation under the node. Okay, so they put in the different, uh, they put in translation for fields, so you can keep the price field and the image field as uh, undetermined, undetermined language, and you can translate the body, your custom field, your title. Of course, title didn't actually happen, unfortunately. Um, it was removed. So Drupal core's nature is that sometimes stuff get added and they get removed. Um, and that's how it went. So title is not a field. It's not possible to translate it this way, but a lot of the other things are. So this is very good because uh, the body field is right there in core, you can translate it. And there's all kinds of stuff you can do. You can add the custom field, you can add an image field that's not translatable, etc. So um, you can decide on the field by field basis on what you want to translate. And uh, you don't need to copy that data elsewhere. And what's also very good is that all those, all those relations will work because your signups will just work with the node, your organic group will just work with the entity, or the, the five star will just work with the entity. So everything will work nice, okay? So this is very good. However, um, there's all these problems with the same things. Like, what if you want to actually store votes per language, like you're interested in whether the English audience voted for this better or the French? Uh, that's kind of not in there unless they know the language under the node. Same thing goes for author. It's not a field, so you cannot make it translatable. It goes with, uh, with the permission associated with the author. You cannot make the different translations be available under different permissions because it's not a field, it's not translatable. It has one author and they have the permission. Same goes for status, same goes for menu item relations. So all the things that are not fields now are a problem because, um, because you cannot make them translatable. So we have these two models and we, both, we have both of them in Drupal 7, okay? So we have the node relation model, it's in implemented in the content translation model and the field translation model as well. And in both cases, there's a problem of you need to relate to either a node or a translation set or a node and, and language under there. In the first case, shared data is duplicated. In the other case, the um, under the node kind of structure is not well known. So, so there's all these uh, problems we face. But the main problem really with this model is that you have two models, okay? So if you are the five-star maintainer, your main problem is, okay, I'm a five-star five maintainer and I want to solve the, I want to have voting for, for multilingual sites. So the voting can either happen for a node or a voting can happen for a, a node in a translation set or the whole translation set or a language under a node, okay? So like a module maintainer who wants to support multilingual needs to understand two models of translation and they don't understand either. It's not a specific comment for a five-star maintainer. It's, it's a comment for a lot of module maintainers. And why would they need to understand it, right? If we can design a system where by default it will work for them, um, we could eliminate this problem that they need to understand all the guts of the system to work with them. So the possible fix that we uh, come up, came up with, but we don't have any concrete solutions for that yet, is that, is that we uh, make stuff uh, fields. So body we already solved, okay, so body is a field that's done, that there's nothing to do there. Uh, for a title, it would be, in our, in our system, it would be ideal to make it a field uh, like it was. Uh, it was pulled out for developer experience and performance reasons. Um, there's a lot of work to do in field translation to improve developer experience, so um, we're looking forward to working on that. And the, the most interesting part is uh, making properties translatable. So you can say this author in this language or that menu item in that language or that status in that language. And, and here actually status is like a real property and author and menu item are just relations to outside things. So those are basically a special case of a relation of this entity to something else. And of course, there's the general thing of likes and votes and all the other kind of relations outside the node. So um, this is basically 
um, this is basically the idea of th that where, that where we can go to and the, and the best part is for the default use case it's going to work for all the relations for